everyone. Welcome. I'm Michaela Parker, founder and executive director of the Academic Data Science Alliance, and I'm here to welcome you to the next installment of our Data Science Conversations. Today, we'll be hearing from New Jersey Institute of Technology and the University of Arizona. But first, I wanted to give you just a little bit of background on ADSA, ADSA, or the Academic Data Science Alliance. We are a community of data science researchers and educators who take responsibility for a just, equitable future where data science approaches are thoughtfully applied in all domains for the benefit of all. At the bottom of this slide, there's a QR code. You can snap that. It will also appear on the subsequent slides. It'll take you to our website where you can learn more about our events and activities, our mission, vision, values, and how to become a member. So with that, I want to thank you for joining us, and I'm going to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Amy Wagler, who is an Associate Professor and Associate Chair of Mathematical Sciences at the University of Texas at El Paso. She directs the Border Biomedical Research Center Biostatistics Unit, the Data Analytics Lab at UTEP, and a new PhD in Data Science program there. Her, she is active in data-intensive medical research as well. So with that brief intro, I'll pass it now over to Amy to introduce our speakers. It's a pleasure to be able to participate in this and hear from our two distinguished speakers. Um, I'll jump right in um, and introduce our first speaker. He will speak and then we'll, um, uh, I'll introduce our second speaker and then he will present. Remember that at any time, if you want to put a question in the chat window, I will be monitoring that as Michaela said. So our first speaker today is Dr. David Bader, a distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science and founder of the Department of Data Science and inaugural, inaugural director of the Institute for Data Science at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Prior to this, he served as a founding professor and chair of the School of Computational Science and Engineering, College of Computing, um, at Georgia Institute of Technology. David is a fellow of the IEEE, AAAS, and SIAM, and also advises at the White House. He most recently advised in the National Strategic Computing Initiative and Future Advanced Computing Ecosystem. David is a leading expert in solving global grand challenges in science, engineering, computing, and the data sciences in general. Welcome, and we're eager to hear from you. As was mentioned, I'm a distinguished professor, having recently moved to the New Jersey Institute of Technology and founding the Institute for Data Science at NGIT, as well as a brand new Department of Data Science that we launched in the fall semester. For those of you who don't know uh, as much about NGIT, we were founded in 1881 as New Jersey's Public Technological Research University. I direct the Institute for Data Science that was launched in July 2019, and we have about 40 faculty spanning multiple colleges in computing, in engineering, in sciences and management here at NGIT. And we've also had a very well-received data science seminar series where most of the talks are available on our YouTube channel that you see the link below. And if you go to our website and subscribe, you'll learn more about our upcoming talks. The Institute for Data Science is the research arm of NGIT in data science. We have five efforts, a center for big data that focuses on big data analytics systems and tools, and research involving advanced cyber infrastructure. We have a cybersecurity research center that focuses on practical encryption technologies, privacy, information assurance, a biomedical informatics center that looks closely at ontologies. We have an emerging FinTech group that interfaces with financial services and the insurance industry, as well as a new center for machine learning and AI where we house many industrial partnerships and focus on real world technologies. So it's a very vibrant research space. Now to tell you about the academics, NGIT was very early to offer a master's in data science, launched fall of 2017, about five years ago. And as I mentioned, the Institute for Data Science was launched in July, 2019. Last semester, we launched 
a early bachelor's degree in data science early in the nation. And this was really one of the um, first BS in data science degrees in our region as well. And we also launched the Department of Data Science that I helped to found, where we have today about six to eight faculty members and a number of joint appointments in this new, somewhat of a startup within academia. And we're planning to have a PhD in data science pending some final approvals, but launched next fall. So fall of, of this year, 2022. And with that, that really completes having a first class academic department that covers bachelor's, master's, and PhD in data science. We're really proud of these early achievements at NGIT. Some of our data science research is housed at a satellite location that we also launched in fall of 2019 in Jersey City, which we call NGIT at Jersey City. It's a satellite campus that's just across the Hudson River from lower Manhattan and really in the heart of the financial services district where we have companies like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America and others located within walking distance. The masters in data science that we are running really covers basic and advanced methods in statistical inference, machine learning, data visualization, data mining and big, and big data, which are all essential skills for a high performing data scientist. So just to give you another view of it, this is looking at New Jersey from the Manhattan, New York side. And you'll see about three quarters of the way over to the right, NGIT at Jersey City on the 36th floor of 101 Hudson Street. This is the Bank of America building. And just in the foreground, a pass station and exchange place that in one stop goes over to the financial district in Manhattan. Now, if you follow the path train to the back or top of this picture, in a few stops, you're in Newark at the very top of this image. And so we're very closely located to both Newark and Manhattan, and really at the heart of this booming area for data sciences. We really encourage anyone in the area to come visit and to meet with us. It's a very convenient location. In addition to having traditional academic degrees, bachelor's, master's, and a forthcoming PhD, we have certificate programs as well. For instance, a certificate in data mining for the data analyst, as well as a certificate in data visualization that can be completed in two years time, taking 12 credits. And we have some certificates for a data engineer, for instance, a certificate in big data and a a uh, certificate in, um, I, I should say, a master's in data science that I talked about for the data scientists. These are the programs that we're running in Jersey City. And we're engaging with a workforce who may be employed already and looking to advance within their position, within their company, or to look at new positions emerging in data science. So these are all certificates and degree, degree programs that our students can take part-time as evening and or weekend courses to complete these certificates and degrees. We've already graduated some of our first cohorts and we get rave reviews for these, these programs. And some of them at this point become oversubscribed with demand for students who would like to get this training. So I wanna thank you for your attention and I look forward to the question and answer to tell you any other questions that you may have about data science at NHIT. Thank you, Amy, and, and thank you to our audience who's here today. Our next speaker today is going to be Dr. Joe Watkins, who is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and also director of the Data Sciences Academy at the University of Arizona, my relative neighbor over here in West Texas. Uh, his research training is in probability theory, and he has collaborated with scholars in anthropology, biochemistry, bacteriology, computer science, entomology, genetics, linguistics, molecular biology, public health physics, and statistics. His service to the community includes chair of the American Mathematical Association Human Rights of Mathematicians, uh, 
the, Amer the American Statistical Association Scientific and Public Affairs Advisory Committee and the AAAS Committee on Academic Freedom and Responsibility. Uh, for a decade, Joe has co-coordinated a math, science, literacy, culture summer experience for high school students from the two primary tribal communities near the Tucson area. Welcome, Joe, and we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you all for inviting me. I enjoy sharing uh, my few minutes with the New Jersey Institute of Technology. You can see from my background and from the pictures that we live in a completely different place than, <clears throat> than the Hudson River. Uh, the name of our entity at the University of Arizona is the Data Sciences Academy. The S is intentional. Uh, it's to remind people that there are a lot of ways to engage in data science, but no one is an expert in anything but a small part of the field. And it, and it reminds us of the complexity of what data science is. So um, the Data Sciences Academy has an origin story. It began in February of 2020 with the design charrette. Uh, so if, for those of you who, who've never uh, thought about this phrase before, and I hadn't until this time, it's often used by architects to put together lots of tables, lots of notes, lots of large sheets of paper, and the goal of that activity is to create a, a mission, in this case, a mission for the Data Sciences Academy. In a charrette, uh, the, the, um, the community is made flat. An undergraduate student has the same status as a dean. And so, um, whoops, did things go bad? Um, and so, uh, uh, so we get together, they spin, they brainstorm, they fill up the, the post-it notes and they fill up lots of information on the, um, on the large sheets of paper and they hand it to me. And so then uh, I am to take that stuff and try to create a mission for the university. Since the design charrette was in February of 2020, you can imagine that did, that did not happen. We thought we were gonna take a few weeks for this coronavirus and then move on, but we're now in our third year of the pandemic and, it, and I think it, it behooves us to take a minute to think about uh, all that we've been through in the past two years and, to, and, and all of us around us and what they, have, what they have been through. So uh, we came up with sort of five areas of emphasis. I'm gonna spend like a minute or so or less than a minute on each one of these. K-14 outreach, because we wanna make sure we include the community colleges, undergraduates, graduates, and research. Um, shoot, I'm having trouble forwarding. Um, for K-14 outreach, we have both summer and, and monthly professional development on data sciences. I would say when we started the teachers who are in a very difficult situation with the rules at their school changing all the time, giving them a brand new way of thinking about teaching was difficult, but around October or November, things completely changed. They started lobbying their teachers, recruiting faculty, talking to their administrators and, and, and making presentations all over the place. So our teachers have presented at after school science at community colleges, They'll present Saturday at the Math Education Appreciation Day. They'll present for the Southern Arizona Science and Engineering Foundation and for the Computer Science Teachers Association. We, we're, we're going to try to extend what we do with teachers with a NASA grant submission called Planet Earth by the Numbers, thinking like a data scientist. And if you, when we get to the questions, you can ask me about that. We want, most students don't know the difference between the majors we have at the University of Arizona, computer science, statistics, systems engineering, management information systems, and the School of Information. So we're, we're, we're providing a flyer, a video, and a poster so that children, their parents, their counselors, their teachers throughout the state will know a difference between these, these ways of becoming a data scientist. For undergraduate research and education, we've partnered with, oh, I should point, point out that we created a statistics and data science degree about three years ago, and it's been, it's been rapidly increasing. We're up to about 250 majors and 100 minors in year three. We, we graduated our first cohort last year of about 25 students. With respect to research, we're, uh, we're partnering with the Undergraduate Biology Research Project, which has been around for 30 years, and we have recruited seven Data Sciences Academy undergraduate fellows uh, in a list of 150 people that applied for this job, all of the fellows finished in the top 15. So we get really, really strong students that want to follow this path. Um, the National Science Foundation just put out a request. They want to make this type of thing a national, um, sent a national idea of having in the undergraduate research space, biological scientists, mathematicians, and computer scientists working together. So 
we, uh, we responded to that and look forward to a national endeavor um, in the data sciences and biological sciences. We also wanna make sure that students with all these choices, the data sciences are recruited into the right major and retaining the undergraduate major, uh, pick what's right for them because the difference between management information systems and, and systems engineering can be different. And if you're in the wrong place, then it could, you could lose valuable time in getting your degree. For graduate education, similarly today, that we're working on a professional master's degree in applied statistics and data science. Um, it also has each of these things involve a certificate, the foundations courses, the applications courses. Ours differs from, from most of the other uh, data science master's degrees in that, in the sense that we want a domain science to be a touchstone for, for the students who go through this program. The first three are likely to be earth sciences, which is a big deal here bioinformatics and natural language processing so that they see their data science applied to an area of interest. They'll also have a capstone experience and the way we've set this up is so that even if you finish the program, you can come back years later if your job requirements change to continue to, to keep yourself up to date on what is new in data science. We're working with uh, Cal Poly Pomona and University of Texas Rio Grande Valley in an STEM planning grant. The idea there is to help people from these underserved populations, Hispanic serving institutions, um, create a space for them so they can make the transition from the BS to the MS to the PhD by creating a community that sort of includes all three universities. So we've just started that uh, and we will be working on over the next two years with the hopes of expanding that to a larger program. For, uh, we also hold a weekly seminar and you can also go to our website and learn about learn about that. Uh, we are now, I think they're about to push the button today for a Tripods grant. Our partners are uh, UC Davis and a consortium from New Mexico that's Los Alamos National Lab, Santa Fe Institute and University of New Mexico. And I can discuss that Tripods grant with you if you would like. Uh, we just funded the, the seed grants for five data sciences at Academy Research Fellows. Uh, and they use that money for graduate students, undergraduate students, equipment and consulting. Um, and, and the projects are interesting. There's sustainable agriculture, climate impact on butterflies, post-fire debris flows, dementia studying, fMRI data, and cosmology. We've also used uh, the academy money to expand opportunities in statistical consulting and, and expand training for our next generation of students in, in consulting. So that's what we're up to. Um, so thank you for taking the time to listen to me and I look forward to the conversation that we're gonna have soon. Those are both really interesting presentations. Um, what impresses me most, uh, my first impression, is just how varied your different programs are and the kinds of activities, research focus that you have within your programs. Um, what, with that in mind, what would you say is the biggest challenge, challenge or challenges that your program has faced? Programs, I should say. So oh, I, I think what, one of the challenges is to differentiate data science from computer science and also to characterize and explain what is data science. When we think about data science, we have everything from developers of new algorithms and tools all the way through users of data science packages. And to create programs, we really have to think about how we speak about these programs, how we address the communities of students and learners that are trying to take these uh, programs and to make sure that we have a impedance match and that they're on their way to the job and career that they're really looking towards. So I think that really is one of the challenges as we, we don't have canonical definitions or curriculum yet for data science, but it's, it's emerging and I'm very optimistic that as we go through um, more time discussions and programs that we'll have more of an understanding as a academic uh, discipline across the nation and around the world uh, as to how to offer the right types of, of courses for these students. Yeah, that certainly is a challenge and one that is not, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of work goes into matching that. Um, Joe, and for you and your programs? So um, just to piggyback off David a little bit, I would say it's also, it's also, 
I find it as much an opportunity as a challenge. So when we when we created this professional master's degree, we we had a, a group of faculty from each of these major units define data science. What is its core and where should it go? That was those are sort of fascinating discussions. And I made the department heads pick the representatives so that the heads knew this was going on. And uh, and then I think that created a community of interest so that so that whatever came out of that was something that we all bought into. We have these a sixth PH, a sixth graduate degree, if you include biostatistics. So finding each other's space, I think is, is, is something that will take some work. But again, I think it's, it's more, it's almost always more delightful than challenging. What I think is challenging is that, is that in the midst of this pandemic, it is hard for the top administration to think about new things. And so, so they're they're busy just trying to you know deal with N95 masks today and, and and vaccination cards and what to do with unruly students. So the time that we get to really think about innovative ideas is really gets pushed to the side. So I think that's a challenge, just to sort of get them to appreciate that universities will need to fundamentally change to accommodate this new way of thinking, and they need to get in front of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I agree, sometimes the challenges are, from the right perspective, really an opportunity, and, and I would count that as among them. Um, so there's a lot of variation in the kinds of programs that you have, and what kinds of adaptations have you made in, with regard to instruction, maybe research mentoring, or um, in your programs? Um, in particularly in light of our current challenges, uh, which is the, the global pandemic. That, that's a, a great David. question. And the, the programs that we offer at NGIT, uh, of course, we've learned how to give remote instruction and online and hybrid instruction. But some of the, the challenges also in data science are access to resources. One thing that we've relied on heavily is AWS Academy. For instance, I teach the introduction course on big data and AWS has an educational program for free where every student gets a sandbox and a hundred dollars worth of credit. And that really has been great for us to have a platform that students can access from home or from the classroom to do their projects and assignments. So it's really figuring out the resources that are available and how students, wherever they may be with whatever technology they have at home on their laptops are able to do work in data science. Absolutely, that is, that is so important, especially as we may have physical limitations with um, access to computing resources. And, and Joe, for you? I asked the question again, I just wanna- um, What kind of, uh, adaptations have you made with regard to instruction and or research mentoring in light of the pandemic? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's, hard to think of, question. it's hard to think of what's the same. So um, I, do, I, I do think that we, that the role of, of me is, as, as, a, as, a, um, as a sort of a senior personnel in this endeavor it, is to really work hard at making connections because those of us who've been, I've been at the University of Arizona for 30 years. So those of us who have been here for a long, long time, when we hear about something, we know, I just got a, a, a chat and email about a connection in Arizona. We know so many people. And so, so it's up to us really to help make those connections. Uh, with respect to what David was talking about, we were, were lucky enough to have Cybers. I don't know if people know about Cybers, but it's a national infrastructure endeavor that is at the University of Arizona. And so we actually have the ability to have training in, in containers and so on through 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 our own university. And so um, so that, that we use that to try to help people. When I did these seed grants, I was pretty nasty. I had the seed grant reviewers be all senior professors, deans, vice presidents, I didn't care. I wanted the most senior people at the university to see what our young scholars were doing. And then I want them to sort of try to, try to play a role of mentoring. If these most senior people see what our youngest people are doing, I think that can help sort of spread the word of what, what's going on. Because I think right now it would be, a re it's really tough to be an assistant professor and to try to get your way through the tenure. Absolutely. Um, so we do have an online chat uh, question. Let me see if I can get back to it here uh, from Michaela. She mentions that your programs have a great breadth of mm -hmm. offerings and how are these managed, staffed and funded? David, I'll let you go first. 
Sure, thank you. So data science at NHIT has launched as a first class academic department. So our academic programs are managed in a traditional way with a department chair, a dean, et cetera. And we hire faculty into this department. We took some existing faculty to really see the department. And we have searches ongoing right now for a new department chair, as well as many openings for faculty lines for faculty who will be very collaborative and work in this emerging area of data science. In terms of our research, our research has centers and institutes that are the research overlay where it's much easier to work with faculty in your department or other departments in the college or around the university through centers and institutes. So we've separated the management of teaching and research, although it's one big happy family. People love to work together and we have very few boundaries to, to really complete projects together. In fact, we have a fantastic space weather group, one of the leading groups in the nation. We run the Big Bear Solar Observatory that's in California. That's a big data problem as well that works a lot with computing. We also have some strengths in health sciences in the pharmaceutical industry and also FinTech where we work very seamlessly across departments and with outside organizations. So that's a little bit about the internal organization for data science, both in terms of teaching and, and research. So a great place to be right now. Yeah, that, that does sound great. Um, and, and you, Joe? Our story is, is, is vastly different in that sense. I would say that our president, when he first showed up, wanted to create something like you might see at NJIT, but each of the deans like having data science in their own college, engineers, business, um, social behavioral sciences, the sciences, the culture of the colleges differ. And so I think the people on the faculty were happier to stay inside their own colleges. So I think the idea of creating a big entity was something that was not going to happen. Uh, on the other, so then, so this academy came by as a way to sort of create this umbrella so that people could communicate. And so, so that's, that's my job. So my entire staff is a one quarter time uh, admin and a one quarter time outreach coordinator. That's the entire staff. Okay, but, but our job is to sort of, as you see, we, we create all these sort of opportunities for people to collaborate. So I, I became sort of, we became sort of a, the commons, which allows people to do things together. Yeah, um, so yeah, there is that variety in terms of just the climate of the university can make such a difference in how things ultimately are organized, staffed, funded, and so forth. Um, let's see, for our next question, let's, let's look at, let's think about the students a little bit more. I'm interested in, each of you had programs going from like minors at the undergraduate level or majors at the undergraduate level up to doctoral level of programs. And I'm interested in what, what is, how is enrollment changing? Uh, a couple of you mentioned, uh, I think there were a couple mentions of that in the presentation, but how are degree options trending as well? Like masters versus undergrad or is, is one uh, level, um, trending more than the others and so forth? So uh, that's a great question. And if you look at the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, you see that data science is really just booming uh, around the nation. And in fact, around the world with all of the great jobs that are emerging, not just in the computer and technology sector, but across every sector, whether it's entertainment and gaming, finance, transportation, health, you name it, you see data science as a need as we move to a more data-driven economy. So when we look at that, we find that the students who are coming at the undergraduate level, master's and PhD, there's a groundswell of those who wanna come for data science. And in fact, with NJIT, we're in the Newark, New York, Manhattan metro region. This is the biggest region in the country for data science jobs. When you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you see that this is just a, a top place. And with that, we've tried to offer a number of degree programs to really match with those students looking to move into this, these new roles in these new workforces uh, as they develop. And 
So uh, I, I really think that we, we're not losing or um, taking away from computer science or other disciplines, mathematical sciences to create data science. We're really growing the pie with new students and new opportunities. So we're seeing a huge demand in terms of applicants for these types of programs at all levels, bachelor's, master's, and, and PhD. That's, that's great to hear. And um, a quick follow-up question, and then um, I'd love to hear from Joe next. Um, do you see more diversity in their academic backgrounds or maybe general backgrounds of the students going for these data science programs? I, I do. So uh, I see diversity on many different Axes. I see diversity in terms of the students' backgrounds. They mm -hmm. may, for instance, graduate students may not be coming from a undergraduate computer science or data science degree program. They may be coming from other areas of sciences or engineering or e even from the liberal arts and looking to get into data science. And so I see a much broader um, aperture of the students that we're getting into these programs. And then the students themselves, when I look at our diversity of our incoming class, we have much more diversity in our student body along a number of axes in terms of um, gender, race, um, geographic region, and so on. It's, it's just fantastic to see. So I think of data science as really a, a area that attracts a broader set of people and that's because data science, to me, engages with the types of real world problems that you're going to solve. We're often yeah. dealing with tangible yeah. data sets. And once you mm -hmm. start thinking about data, you think about where it comes from, how it's going to be used, but you're really talking about people and how you make the world a better place for populations. And I think that really attracts a, a larger set of folks to this great and fantastic discipline. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's wonderful to hear. Um, so, Joe, for you, I'll kind of repeat the question um, since that was a long um, pause there. But what kinds, types, or levels of programs uh, do you see to be trending within your institution? And then the follow up is about those backgrounds of the students attracted to your programs. Um, well, statistics went from zero to 250 in three years. So that's <laughs> wow. That's that's a, and um, with no signs of slowing up, I think part of it has to do, in that case, it has to do with the fact that it wasn't there. And so students who are in mathematics or computer science mm -hmm. might like statistics better. It's a better fit for them. And there's a lot of engineers who don't want to take organic chemistry, but would rather take the things that go with the data science kinds of mm -hmm. degrees. So we, we're getting a, a bunch of those. So that's the trend. We have at the University of Arizona, one of the founders of SOCNOS, if you know what that is. Mm -hmm. And so the issue of diversity among Native Americans and Hispanics, which the issues here, have always been a strong component for the mathematical sciences. Uh, I would say the computer scientists, I sit on their diversity conversations, are not anywhere near where they want to be. And they're worried about people sort of drifting from computer science and out of computer science. And the question is, are they doing it because computer science is not a friendly place for one reason or another, or because it's just the wrong major for them? It's really hard to tell. And so that's why we're spending a lot of energy mm. with incoming freshmen and high school students so they understand the, 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 uh, the spectrum of data sciences and make, make an informed choice from the beginning. Sure. On, on the larger scale, I am nowhere near happy with the diversity we have. Nothing close to what we need. Uh, if you think about the challenges that David talked about, the, the size of the workforce that needs to be, you know, no, no linear algebra, right. let's say, is enormous. And so, uh, and so our videos and, 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 and sheets go around to particularly underserved populations, so they become um, aware early of, of, the ch of the challenges that they face and how data science are, can help them. So they finish their Algebra 2 course or take the pre-calculus course or take statistics in high school, learn Python when they're 16, the things that can give them a leg up so that so that when they come here, they can worry about water on the Navajo reservation, worry about crops in Yuma, worry about you know safe mining in, in the mining districts and so on, uh, worry about climate change in Arizona, because those are things they really care about. I also think that uh, if you teach mathematics in the way that we've always taught it, 
then you're not going to attract these students. But if you teach mathematics the way most of us who are mathematicians think about it, it's like an exploratory journey, and you bring that in, and data is the one that really facilitates that exploratory journey, then I think you can get a lot more students involved. Yeah, absolutely. Both really um, good points and um, interesting perspectives from two different institutions that I see a lot of commonality and absolutely I agree we we have got to transform to meet the needs and challenges of the workforce and the needs of our students right now. Um, speaking of, I think I saw you Joe mentioned some collaboration with K through 12 systems or K through 14 including community college. Um, how, how, how are you at both, both institutions establishing these partnerships and what approach are you taking? Okay, so we are extremely fortunate to have something called the Center for Retention and Recruitment of Mathematics Teachers as part of the Department of Mathematics. Now they recognize that the integration of data into teaching is, is central, but they just don't have the bandwidth to do, to train mathematics teachers and and, and do the sort of data science stuff that they would like to do. So they've been a real help in getting us involved. We have mathematics education inside of the math department. So they, they, really, they really know the community well. Mm -hmm. uh, SARSAF, which is this, the Southern Arizona Research Engineering Foundation, which does all the science fairs. Our committee is amazing. Our committee has Janice Mack, who, who informs the Board of Education on Computer Science Education, Margaret, uh, Wilch, who has an honorary doctorate for her mentoring of students in research and is the research director of SARSEF. And, and, uh, and those two, those two just sort of changed our ability to reach the community. Like every week that we meet, we, I learn about some new avenue of things that goes on. And then our, and then our, ad, our, our staff person is Angela Marquez, who's, who's Navajo, and so her understanding of the region is, is really amazing, and also her enthusiasm to teach data science is also amazing. So I think having that committee with so much, with so many perspectives has made the K through 12 experience. Oh, Move that's great. It's, my, it's one of my favorite hours of the week when we meet together. Yeah. No, that's very valuable and so important to have uh, such a broad range of perspectives on, on that kind of committee. I mean, it's gonna make such a difference in the outreach, your, your potential. Um, and David, you, for your institution. Sure, at NGIT, we work very closely with a number of community colleges and minority serving institutions. For instance, okay. my colleagues in the mathematical sciences have partnered and working with schools like Essex County College that uh, really train a number of local um, Essex County, Newark based students. It's just been phenomenal. We also work with K through 12. For instance, in my own lab, I've hosted internships for New Jersey based undergraduates. Some of them are really phenomenal, have gone on to uh, colleges uh, all around the country, really doing stellar. And so what we try to do is offer the research engagements and the educational engagements with our uh, community partners all around the state. Wonderful. Yeah, that is that is such a focusing on that application of real world data for those, like you talked about those issues that are of importance to these students is a, is a key uh, way to bring them into the discipline. I should um, also mention, just to, yes. to follow up on, on my own answer, we have organizations in New, New Jersey, such as the New Jersey Big Data Alliance, that has externships for students. It's been fantastic. We, we also have a number of regional partnerships. For instance, Columbia University runs the Northeast Big Data Hub, and we're a part of the uh, Northeast uh, Data Science Student Corps that was launched oh. by the Northeast Big Data Hub. And so these are phenomenal ways to really reach out to students and also our peers at community colleges as well to uh, understand how to better deliver data science curriculum and also to work with these fantastic students in, in the region. Absolutely. And that was a wonderful lead in to my next question. So thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit more about any partnerships you've developed with local industries or organizations like you were speaking of that either hire your students, provide internships for students 
um, and describe just kind of the nature of those partnerships. Do you want to lead, David? <laughs> sure. So uh, the Institute for Data Science at NHIT has formed an industrial advisory board. We have representatives from com companies like Amazon, Stanley mm -hmm. Black & Decker. We have the New York Times, Accenture. We have Google. We have um, local industry like Cherry that does real estate data, data science. We have Bayer. We have just a whole bunch of, of folks and I'm leaving uh, many, many off. It, it's about 15, 16 uh, folks. We, we also have financial sector, city, we have BlackRock. And this is just a phenomenal engagement with these companies, uh, both in the region and in the area. We've also had deep research partnerships with companies in the area like UPS. There's a number of health and pharmaceutical companies that we work closely with, uh, as well as the, the fintech sector, some of the companies I, I mentioned just prior. And this is really a great place. We're in the heart of data science here at NGIT. And these relationships take on many different forms. In some cases, these companies, and often we have hundreds of companies that mentor our undergraduate student capstone projects, where student teams work with a problem that's put forward by those companies and develop solutions with those companies. In fact, sometimes those companies hire those students because they've done so well and, and the partnership works out so great. Mm -hmm. We also have companies that do grant or contract work with the university to engage with our students and support, for instance, graduate students through their education. We also have very good placement of our students with many of these companies and others that, that I mentioned. So we engage with wow. companies in, in many different ways, but it, it's a natural and easy in, engagement. We also have many great partners in, in this region. And again, not just in the IT or computer sector, but the companies that we work with come from many different sectors because everyone out there needs a data scientist. And so it's really with that, that we look very broadly at our vision of data science and the companies that we work with. Some of, some of them would surprise you because you wouldn't think of them as a data science company. Sure. So it, it's, a, you know, it, it's really something that we value. We feel that a data scientist really has to touch real data and real people. And with that, we have to translate our research to these companies and work very closely with these companies as well. Wow. Yeah. The, the breadth and depth of all of those partnerships and the uh, variations of the kinds of research versus students, that's very impressive. Something asked, um, to aspire to. Um, Thank you. And, and Joe, as well, for you, oh, any so industry so I would say that Arizona can never compete with a university across the Hudson from. <laughs> <laughs> Nor El Paso. <laughs> but, and 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 our our uh, we were we were founded in you know in early two, 2020. So so we haven't created an industrial board yet. Uh, so I have actually talked had one on one Zoom chats with people around town. So who do we have in town? We have Raytheon. We have Roche. We have a, a variety of small. Uh, tech companies that do optics, like I guess a hundred of them. And we have some defense department research and some cybersecurity research. They're small companies. So when I talk to them, I say, would you like this degree? And they, and they, and they squint at me. And then I describe the degree in about 10 minutes, they go, yeah, we could really use a person like that. Yeah. Because if there's sort of nobody that does this sort of data science in the room, then I, I had one conversation. They, somebody comes in as a consultant, they talk for a while. Uh, and then they come back three months later to the CEO and say, here's what we have. And the CEO says, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> and, so, and so you could go back again. I, so I said, but what if you have a person in the room that knew a little machine learning, could visualize data, could understand statistical tests, could have five conversations with the CEO. And then by the time the consultant comes in, there's really a productive conversation. So I think, and I think a lot of the interesting jobs are going to be at these sort of smaller dynamic places. So right now I'm busy just trying to, to get um, that mindset into Tucson, but I said we'll we'll never be New Jersey Institute Technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a little slower growth in um, 
regions like in the southwest or anything away from those hubs like california or the east coast um for sure um let's see uh we did talk a little bit about partnerships with other schools and universities um but anything more that you would like to add on that i know you both have a like existing partnerships with the community colleges, but other maybe institutions that um, are growing in terms of their data science offerings and how you might support them. Jay, you want to take this one? First <laughs> ah, sorry. So, so I I'll let you lead. Yeah. So we mentioned two of them. We have an STEM grant with the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley and Cal Poly Pomona. So those are those are very strongly Hispanic. We're, we are one of the two or three research one universities in the country. I hate to give it that that that's a Hispanic serving institution. And so we, I view the University of Arizona as sort of a donor institution, whereas the other ones, which are come from often research poor areas, really need our collaboration to help them out. So our goal in that case is to work with those universities to to I said usually often students don't want to make big moves for family or financial reasons. So our, our goal in that case is to create a community so that students feel like they're going from their bachelor's degree to their PhD, if that's their goal, in a community that they know from the beginning. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the consorting we're doing with tripods includes um, UC Davis and, and University of New Mexico, all three with, completely surrounded by a lot of small Hispanic serving institutions. So we, we're building a big consortium uh, data science HSI consortium so that so that we can create a lot of collaborative space. Also, I think faculty at these smaller universities or research inter have in interest in research find limited time. And so our goal is to find partnerships with those faculty yeah. at all institutions so they have time to do things. If you teach three courses, you can never get away because nobody there's not enough room to, to teach for you, then, then we want to be there to help. So that's sort of the types of collaborations we're looking at. That's great. So Amy and NJIT, we work with a, a number of universities around the company. Being a, a top research university, for instance, right now I'm working on a uh, proposal with MIT and Stanford. We have existing research with Rutgers, with University of Southern California, and many other schools around the country. So we're really engaged doing projects for National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, DARPA, IARPA, and it's been very, very successful. We also work very closely with national laboratories. We have collaborations with Oak Ridge, with Pacific Northwest National Lab, Brookhaven, with Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and others. And that's also a great way to work on real problems with real data sets where there are mission needs for, for instance, compressing data, for transporting data, for new types of computation on those data sets, and also working on problems related to national security. So in addition to working yeah. with other universities, there's federal agencies as well as national laboratories that we work just as easily and, and closely with. Absolutely, that's a great point and something um, I should have thought to mention. Um, we, we work with Los Alamos and Sandia and um, I guess those and Lawrence Livermore, just like Lawrence, yeah, yeah. So we, we're sort of regionally focused, and they, yeah, we shift, we shuttle our students back and forth all the time between those places. Absolutely. Also, yeah. all those students, we have them. <laughs> um, one last question, and bear with me; it's going to be a little long to lead in, and then I'm going to throw it back to Michaela because our time is nearly up. Uh, so this, it, it's just an interesting comment I wanted to share with you off of the chat. Um, so. Uh, Nathan Kelver mentioned that he has an NLP education project that he's working on with a librarian um, at Arizona. And they're planning on running a virtual learning institute on, in the summer. And then he provides a link in the chat if you want to go take a look at that. Um, and but what I find interesting about his point and what Michaela follows up on in just a moment in the chat window is development of open educational resources. I know I make use of those a lot. I feel like that's such, as such an important educational resource, but how has your institution or program um, incentivized faculty to develop and distribute these kinds of open educational resources? 
if, if, if there's any development in that area. Well, my textbook is free. <laughs> well, that's, that's the first step. <laughs> I don't plan to ever charge for it. Um, and I, and the, on the K-12 page, we actually maintain sort of vetted resources for teachers that are free. So I would say that's the major thing that we do is we yeah. encourage, encourage resources in K through 12 at this stage so that teachers can have a hold of it because they never have any money to do things. Absolutely not. Um, and that's a good place to begin. Um, I, I agree. And and David? This is an area where, where I may not be the, the best versed as to what activities we, we have going on. We do create a number of courses and curriculum that are online based so that students all around the world can can take these. Um, but in, in terms of open resources, we often work on tutorials for data science that faculty are yeah. able to share and distribute. And also the Northeast Big Data Hub is a great uh, centerpiece for finding these resources and learning more about them. And we work very closely with the Northeast Big Data Hub. So I encourage everyone who's looking for these types of resources to navigate over there where you can find just a, a incredible list of, of these open resources. Yeah, and that's we, a great tip. Yeah. If we get tripods, it has a substantial open resource component to it. Almost all the tutorials, the small class and so on will be will be open. So that's at the graduate level and at the research level. Great. Well, that's something to look forward to. Um, thank you both for your time. It's been really great talking with you and getting to hear more about your program. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Michaela now. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Amy. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, David, for this really great conversation. I wanted to shout out all of the big data hubs because I know the South Big Data Hub has also got a lot of work going on in, in educational resources. So definitely for checking out those kinds of open, uh, open educational opportunities that the, all of the big data hubs are, are doing great work there. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining us. Thank you audience for your questions. I only wanted to remind you that next week, January 26th on Wednesday, at the same time, we do have that next virtual session on non-ableist data science. Um, so with that, thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Amy. It was really great to hear about the breadth of your programs and your views for the future of data science and how your, you view your programs and your role in supporting and training that next generation of the workforce that we all know is coming. So thanks once again, and I hope all of you have a great rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>